Hi, I'm Pastor Paul. Welcome to session three on our team membership. Today we're going to be discussing how it is that we spend time with God. And time with God is one of the most important aspects of being a healthy, fully devoted Christian. And so, if you pull out your team membership manual at this time, you should have a book like this, then you can um, turn to the section which talks about the characteristic of a team member, time with God. If we look at that example of Jesus Christ, um, he showed a tremendous amount of time that it was with fellow disciples as well as time with God. If you have your Bibles, turn to a section in the book of Luke. And let's just look for a moment together at how God, or Jesus spent time with God on a daily basis. In Luke um, chapter 5, verse 16, we see that he has done a healing event with a man with leprosy. We also see where after healing them, there's crowds came around him and the news spread about his healing. So people were like, wow, we want to spend time with Jesus. But what did Jesus do? In the midst of all this excitement and in the midst of all the things that were taking place, he did this. It says, Yet the news about him spread all the more, so that the crowds of people came to hear him and to be healed of their sicknesses. But here's the key. But Jesus often withdrew to lonely places and prayed. So you see, in the midst of all his popularity and healing and all these things taking place, he still took time to spend with his Father. Time alone. And that's one of the key principles is, is spending alone time with God, whether it be we, in the morning or in the evening, it doesn't matter. But it's finding that time that you can carve out just for you and God. If again we look in um, Luke 6, just go uh, in the next chapter, and we'll see again where he's having a conversation about um, the Lord of the Sabbath as Jesus. He's talking about how the Sabbath was meant for us to spend time with God. But then likewise, we see where he demonstrates this in verse 12. It says, One of those days Jesus went out to a mountainside to pray, and he spent the night praying to God. And when morning came, he called his disciples to him and chose twelve of them, who all he designated as apostles. So you see this link of him spending the whole night in prayer. Of course, that led to who he chose as disciples as well. So God gave him a vision, gave him an example. He listened to God. He spoke with God. And so that alone time with God, there's not a formula of how to do it. Um, for myself, I've had it, done it in different ways in different seasons of my life. But typically it has to do some scripture reading. Sometimes I'll do a devotional book where I can read things and other authors have said or, or work through a section of reflection questions. Um, sometimes I've had seasons where I've read and then journaled for a while. We just finished a mission trip and we had a book called Challenge. And we did is every morning we got up and there was a challenge devotional for us to read and some scripture to look up and then some journaling time that, that challenged us. And so there's not a right way or a wrong way, it's just making sure you carve out that time with God. I'd like you to do is, um, at this time, just to take a few moments and talk to your neighbors here in the class about, do you spend time with God? And if so, what is the kind of quiet time you spend with God? Is it a morning? Is it in the evening? Do you carve it out during your lunch hour? And when you spend time with God, what is your typical pattern? Maybe you get a, a, an e-devotional that you get on your internet, or maybe you just pull out the old book like I do. Whatever it is, take a few moments and share amongst yourselves how you spend time with God. I hope your discussion time went well. And I want to just get a little bit deeper about the importance of prayer, whether it be in quiet time or prayer in terms of um, corporate prayer. Um, if you look at the next section of our team membership manual, you'll see um, several scriptures that you can look up and discuss with each other. And one of these is um, from Philippians 4, 6 through 7, Matthew 7, which is, of course, the Lord's Prayer, uh, James 4, which talks about prayer, 1 Thessalonians 5, 17, and Matthew 6, 9 through 13. This one from uh, Philippians chapter 4, 6 through 7 says this. Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything by prayer and petition, or sometimes they say by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving present your requests to God, and the peace of God which transcends all understanding will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. I love this, to lift everything before God in prayer. That's the calling of being a fully devoted follower. At Crossroads, we hope that people pray continuously, literally as Paul suggests. If you see at a Crossroads Church, you see that we take prayer pretty seriously. Um, our phone number here is 469-PRAY. We have a prayer room that isn't just for prayer, but we call it the prayer room to continually remind us that prayer is what this is about. I'm filming this today in what's called our fasting room because we believe that prayer and fasting go together. We have a prayer chapel that people can go to after the services if they want more quiet time or reflection or want to meet with a prayer counselor. So we, we lift up the power of prayer and the importance of prayer. 
Um, I feel blessed that sometimes my nickname at the Rotary Club and other places has been Praying Paul because again, it challenges me and reminds me that that's what I should be about. And frequently you'll find any member of the staff here at Crossroads Church will say things like, how can I pray for you when we finish our conversations? And so I hope that that will be a, a phrase that you will use more frequently as a member of Crossroads Church, that when you're with somebody, talking a family member, relative, you will start to think about, how can I pray for you? How can I be involved spiritually in your life? If you look at your team membership manual, we see a pattern for prayer that, that God has shared with us, which I think is a, a great way to pray. And it's used with the acrostic ACTS, A-C-T-S. And we can see this pattern in the Lord's Prayer, but we see it in other places, in the Psalms, other um, parts of the prayer life of the Bible. And it, the A stands for adoration. And adoration prayers are simply praising God for who He is, that He's the creator of the universe, praising God for His uh, compassion and His steadfastness, praising God for the fact that He has given us His Son, Jesus Christ. And so part of our pattern for prayer is to come to God, and you think about coming before a king, in that same way, you'd come and you would, they would say there'd be a herald or someone that would be anointed to, to, to praise the king as he came in. And then the second is confession. Just like if you think about coming before a king, they would say that many times you would kneel down, you'd bow down, and you would confess, you know, I'm not worthy to spend this time with you, but would you please hear my, my, my plea? And so, at that same way we come before God, we get clean before God, get real with God if you would say, you know, Lord, I'm not perfect, and here's the mistakes I made this month or this week or just today. And these mistakes may have a barrier between you and me, and I just want to confess them so that you can forgive me, and I know that we're in better relationship again. And so, those prayers of adoration remind God how much we love Him. The prayers of confession remind God how we're not perfect, even though He is, but we still want to be in relationship with Him. And then the prayers of thanksgiving are the, the, the gratefulness we feel when God forgives us of our sins. So when we confess our sins and, and it says, do not be anxious about anything as it said in Philippians, but then we're like, wow, I get it. You forgive me. I, all these sins, all these burdens I've been carrying, I can now lay these at the foot of your cross and I don't have to take them out of this room with me anymore. You've received them. And so we have the spirit of thankfulness for, for receiving our, our sins, but also thankful for all the things He's done for us. We can say prayers of thankfulness for our children, or, or thankfulness for our work and our jobs, and a home to live in, and a food to eat, and give God thanks for specific things that God has answered according to His Word and in prayer. So adoration again, those are just prayers about God, to God, for who He is. Confessional prayers, they're about us and the mistakes we've made. Thanksgiving prayers are things we're grateful for and the ways that we've been forgiven and the, the blessings we've received from God. And then the last portion is called prayers of supplication or petition. It, they're intercessory prayers, the prayers that we lay before God on behalf of ourselves or others. And so many times these are the prayers people go to first for God, they go, God I need this, God I want this. And actually they're the ones we should do last. After we've adored God, after we've confessed our sins and removed the barriers, after we thank God for all His many blessings, then going to God and saying, Now God, can I make a request? Would you please? You know, it's sort of like a kid when they come up to us and they start yanking us and, Daddy, 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 I need this, I want this. Or would you rather help a child who's been helping out around the house, who's been grateful for the things you've given them, who hasn't talked back to you? Of course you'd rather help that child, right? Because you see that they have an attitude of gratitude. And so if they come and ask for a request, you're like, wow, I want to help this child. In that same way, we don't want to come as um, little children before God, just tugging on Him and saying, I need this, I want this. We come before Him, adoring Him, confessing, thanking Him, and then saying, and if you would, within your will, could you answer these my requests? And then maybe requests for you, those are called prayers of petition or intercession on behalf of somebody else, like someone who may be sick or someone who's grieving or someone who's going through loss. Or even bigger things like world peace or world hunger, these big items, we just lay before God. And so that pattern of Acts, A-C-T-S, is one of the ways we can formulate our prayer life, whether it be private time with God or in small groups or in worship. It's one of the ways we can lift up um, that sense of praying for God for a variety of needs and concerns. At this time, I'm going to actually ask you to take and turn off the camera for a while and practice prayer. That may seem strange to some of you, but many times it's amazing how we do not practice prayer. And so our group leader today is going to kind of go through a typical prayer of adoration, confession, thanksgiving, and supplication, and then have you kind of practice it in groups of two or three so you can get used to praying out loud and praying using this pattern. 
All right, so turn off the camera and take a few moments to practice the Acts form of prayer. I'd like to talk to you now about time in small groups. As I said before, we want to spend time with God individually, in small groups, in the larger body of Christ. And for a lot of people who have been Christians, even quite a while, they maybe never experienced time in an intimate community of believers. And yet this is biblical. God tells us, in fact, that unless we're doing time with other believers, we're probably really not connecting with Him. Because it's through the, the voice of others, the community of Christ, if you will, that we really have an understanding of who God is. And so, <clears throat> if we look in our scripture to Acts chapter 2, we see this in the fellowship of the believers. <clears throat> in Acts chapter 2, verse 42, they says this, They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to the fellowship, to the breaking of bread and of prayer. And everyone was filled with awe, and many wonders and miraculous signs were done by the apostles. All the believers were together, and they had everything in common, selling their possessions and goods they gave to anyone who had need. And every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. And the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. Doesn't that sound like just the sweetness of this early community of believers that were following Jesus? And see, this is what we're trying to have as well at Crossroads Church, that sense of community. John Wesley, the founder of the Methodist movement, um, called them um, societies. Some of them are called societies or small groups. And it was a gathering of people outside of worship where they could share things like their, their journeys together, their highs and lows for the week. They could pray for one another and also hold one another accountable for things that they like to accomplish in their reading or their scripture or their learning. And so <clears throat> at Crossroads Church, we've um, kind of come up with a, a way to think about how small groups work. We call it Know, Grow, Care, and Share. We say that each small group has a know component or we often call that a fellowship component. And so we often have small groups start with food or snacks. Um, most small groups even end with food or snacks. And so we get that one down pretty good. And as part of the no component or fellowship component, many times there may be a social activity or, or the small group was based on. And many times we'll have a small group will start with something we call highs and lows or joys and concerns and kind of sharing and fellowship with one another things that are going on in their life. The second component is what we call grow. And the grow component is discipleship. We expect every small group to have some form of discipleship, some way where they draw closer to God, either the study of His Word or through prayer or other things. And so most of our small groups will begin with prayer and also have times of prayer throughout the small group. And even more fellowship-based small groups, like say the softball team or a group that gets together to do crafting, will still start with prayer and have a devotional time built within um, what they're doing for an activity. We also um, have small groups that are pretty much based on what I call discipleship small groups. For example, we have the Hebrew Heritage class that's often taught in our Monday night um, group. And they spend, I'd say, 90% of the time digging into God's Word, but they still have snacks, they still have fellowship, they still do other components of the no grow care share. So what is the third component? Care. Care equals ministry. We expect every small group to not only have fellowship and to, to grow together, but we expect them to give something back in terms of ministry. Many of our small groups will like maybe take a turn to serve our, one of our community meals, or they may step in as a ministry and help on a Sunday morning um, giving out communion, or they may serve in ministry to help clean the church or take on a project like um, roadside cleanup. And so we say that each small group should do something to give back to the larger body of Christ and, and to serve in some way. We also use that term for ministry to say that we should serve one another in the small group. So sometimes it's things like someone in a small group gets sick or someone is struggling, they might bring food by or care for that person in some manner to serve them. Know, grow, care, and then the last is share. We expect every small group to not just be internally focused but externally focused. And so the share is evangelism. It's a mission in the world, if you will. And so we encourage every small group to have some aspect of their small group time whether it be a project that they take on, a special offering they give, but to share in terms of evangelism, reaching out to invite new people to the small group, but also share in terms of mission. Maybe go to feed our starving children as a small group or to take on a project where they can serve and so that they see the larger body of Christ, the, the ab ability, if you will, to, to reach out in love and acceptance. 
So each person in Crossroads is expected to not only have time with God quietly and individually, but also time in a small group. In fact, we say at Crossroads Church that small groups are the church. It's not a program. It's not like a Sunday school class you take as an addition. It is the church. So until you're in a small group, you haven't experienced church. You haven't experienced community, the people of the way. And so we see that this is biblical in Scripture. So we make this mandatory at Crossroads that to be a church member, a team member, that you're spending time in a small group where you can function fully in the body of Christ. Now I'd like to take a few moments and to talk with some of your neighbors about either small group experiences you've had and how those have affected you in your faith journey. Or if you've never been a part of a small group, why not? And what would you hope to get out of a small group if you joined? We're going to do a section in the new members class, which is sometimes kind of difficult, but actually I think it's one of the trademarks that makes Crossroads Church so healthy, and that's conflict. Now you are laughing to yourself saying, conflict? Well, how does that make a church healthy? Every church and every relationship has conflict. That's just a given. The question is, how do you handle conflict? How do you do conflict in a biblical way where afterwards you actually can be closer together than you were before you had a disagreement or an issue? And I think what Crossroads has done really well is we don't have a lot of gossiping in the church. We don't have a lot of um, inappropriate comments made and things because people deal with conflict in an open and loving fashion and they work through differences to see if we can come to a resolution. And this all comes from, uh, obviously, Jesus' advice to his disciples. In Matthew 18, there's a section of scripture where Jesus says, this is how you should handle when you have a sin in the church or a conflict in the church. In Matthew 18, Verse 15, it says, If your brother or sister sins against you, go and show him his or her fault, just between the two of you. Now right here, 90% of all conflicts could be resolved <laughs> if people would just go one-on-one. -on -one. It's called the one-on-one -on -one principle. And in your new members book, it shows that there. And so one of the keys is, if you have a problem, don't tell everybody else about the problem. <laughs> go to that person. It sounds so simple, but so many of us, we get insulted or we get hurt. And then we go to Facebook or we go to text all of our friends, or we pick up the phone and call somebody and complain, or we gossip about the person. Rather than say, wow, you know, my feelings were hurt, or I'm frustrated, take a breather, find the appropriate time, and then go to that person one-on-one -on -one and say, you know, you said this and you hurt me, or you did this and you hurt me. I'm very blessed as a pastor. I've had a lot of people that I've offended, <laughs> as particularly because I preach and I, and, I, and I try to teach God's Word. And But people are really good and I have to calm me down and go, you know, when you said this in your sermon, this is how it hit me. And this is how I received it. And maybe we should talk about that. Or I do things in meetings many times, inadvertently, where I will hurt someone's feelings. The people are really good at the church of just taking a moment and going to me one-on-one -on -one and saying, you know, I know your heart, Pastor Paul, and I know you didn't mean to hurt me, but this is what you said that kind of insulted me or hurt me. And I'm able to pray with them and we're able to work through it. Just one-on-one. -on -one. Now that's the best way, and that's the way I'd say 99.9 .9 conflicts get resolved here around Crossroads. But sometimes a conflict is so large, or sometimes the persons can't really forgive each other because it's like a, something that isn't um, able to be dealt with on a one-on-one -on -one basis. So I'll give you an example of what, what Jesus says to do next. He says, But if he will not go and listen, take along one or two others, so that every matter may be established by the testimony of two or three witnesses. Now this is the next section, which is sometimes you need a mediator, a person or two that can step in. So often what we'll do is like, for example, we had a conflict resolved the other day in the churches where I said to that person, sounds like you're frustrated with this staff member. I tell you what, I will get together with the staff member and, and um, you get to bring somebody in from your perspective that you'd like to share and could be an advocate for you. And we'll all get together and we'll talk. And so I kind of mediated a meeting where the staff person and this other person could grieve their differences. Typically what I'll do is I start a meeting where I make them affirm each other first. I'll say, what are the things you appreciate about this person? What are the things you appreciate about this person? So they start that groundwork of like, well, I'm not here just to complain. I really do care for this person. And then the second thing I had them do was um, to best define what was the issue or the problem. And then we begin to work on problem solving to get around that issue to see if there's a way that we could resolve it in a peaceful manner. And the good news is we did. They both kind of brainstormed and talked about how we could resolve this for future uses. So we were able to leave then praying for one another and again ending with affirming one another. And again, 
that hasn't happened that often here at the church. We need to have a mediation. But when it does, it seems like we resolve them pretty well. Now, on the rare occasion is the next step. It says, if they refuse to listen to the mediation, tell it to the church. And if he refuses to listen to even the church, treat him like you would a pagan or a tax collector. Well, what does this mean? It means that sometimes people can get very stubborn and they can maybe continue to gossip or maybe they can continue to badmouth a staff person or a staff person can be um, fired for, for not working through a problem effectively. And so what we try to do is to say, many times um, this can come to the church. We have a team or a ministry team. So for example, I'll give you an example. We were having a discussion about um, bus usage. And so myself and another person couldn't agree about how to do the bus usage. We had a mediator. We still couldn't agree about how to use the bus. So what we do, we took it to a team of people, the trustees, who put together a policy. And so then it wasn't my opinion or somebody else's opinion about how the bus should get used. A policy was formed by a group of people who listened to all sides, investigated the issues, and then now we have a standard that we can go by when we use the bus, how much it should cost, where it should get parked, how it should be cleaned, um, how it should be reserved. All these things are worked out. And so now that was a conflict is now a policy. And as people can agree or disagree with that, but now we have something in writing that we can all follow. So that's an example of a conflict that got moved to a group setting. Neither one of us left the church, of course, but it was resolved in a, a manner by a group other than a mediator. Okay? So I want you to do is to take a few moments talk with the people around you about maybe a time you were in a church conflict and if it was healthy or unhealthy and how it was either resolved or unresolved and um, take a few moments to discuss that. Our last section on dealing with time has to do with time in worship. We've talked about already time individually with God, alone time, quiet time, devotion time. We've talked about that sense of time in a small group where we spend time in fellowship, we spend time in discipleship, in ministry, and in service. But this type of time we're going to be discussing has to do with how do we connect through the community of Christ. That's one of the keys that, that a lot of people actually come to church for is worship. They want to exalt God and they want to glorify God and to do that in the context of a, a body of Christ, other believers, so that there's more of a sense of the Holy Spirit taking place. We see the pattern for worship is lined throughout scriptures in a variety of places. I'll just read one. There's several that you can look up in your team membership manual together or do in your home journaling time. This is from Psalm 145. It says, I will exalt you, my God, the King. I will praise your name forever and ever. Every day I will praise you and extol your name forever and ever. Great is the Lord and most worthy of praise. His greatness no one can fathom. One generation will commend your works to another and they will tell of your mighty acts. They will speak of your glorious splendor of your majesty and I will meditate on your wonderful works. They will tell of your power and your awesome works and will proclaim great deeds. And they will celebrate your abundant goodness and joyfully sing of your righteousness. It goes on to talk about the characteristics of God and how those are to be shared. I love that section from generation to generation because this was obviously written several generations ago by the psalmist David. And we can see how his prediction of each generation passing on the praise of God to the next through the Hebrew people and now through the Christian movement as well. So spending time together in the body of Christ is a way of glorifying God, but it's also a way of building up the body of Christ. In other words, there's a word called in the Greek edify, which is literally um, to strengthen. And so a lot of our worship is designed to, of course, exalt God, but also it strengthens us. That's the byproduct of worship is that through praising God and giving Him glory, we are blessed as well. Now, a lot of churches do this in a variety of ways. And at Crossroads, we don't have one formula, but again, like the formula for ACTS, A-C-T-S, Adore, Confession, Thanksgiving, Supplication, we discussed in our prayer time, we have a similar one for worship. We have times of adoration. We have times where we have confessional moments of prayer or songs that are confessional in nature. We have times of thanksgiving. We have times of, the E would be education, taking God's Word and and doing it through video or through the preaching of God's Word. And we have times of dedication at the end where we give back to God, whether it be an offering or serving in communion, or we, we um, have things that we do as a challenge when we leave the building. And so this acted is what we use for worship. So we have the songs many times, are, and the, the music time is a big part of that, as well as the message. Music and message communicate this. So what I'd like you to do is to spend some time in your small group discussing what elements of worship are important to you and why? How do you best connect to God? Is it through the music or the message, combination? 
What do you like about Crossroads Church in terms of its message time, whether it be the outlines or the, the multimedia aspects of it? And here's my favorite. If you were to pick my next sermon series or topics, what would they be? And as a small group, you can help decide maybe what would be one of my next sermon series. Take some time to talk together.